Knowing you need surgery can be a source of high anxiety for so many people. And according to the Journal of the American College of Surgeons, organ laceration and hemorrhage are some of the most common adverse events that can occur during surgery. Although no surgery is risk-free, fortunately, there are technologies that can lessen the severity of the complications. So today, a guide to surgical risks, complications, and what you need to know to be proactive before you go in the operating room. I'm Olga Villaverde. Access Health starts right now. If you've ever seen a television medical drama, the complication of bleeding during surgery seems to occur frequently. Now, the fact is the risk of bleeding and blood loss is a common denominator in most surgeries, with heart disease being the number one killer worldwide and up to 500,000 open heart surgeries being performed every year. We wanted to start right there. So joining us today is Dr. Brian Bruckner. He's a cardiovascular surgeon. Doctor, welcome to Access Health. Thanks for having me here today. Doctor, let's Let's just start with basics, anatomy 101. Um, hemorrhage, what is it and what causes it? Well, hemorrhage is a term that we as clinicians use to describe blood loss. And there are various degrees of blood loss that we do encounter in the surgical field. In general, we use uh, four different classifications. One is just minimal bleeding, just like a little bit of oozing that we see in the surgical field. The next one would be uh, sort of what we call medium bleeding. Then we'll see a little bit more bleeding. Then we have what we call moderate bleeding. And finally, severe bleeding. Now, severe bleeding is something that as surgeons we don't like to see or encounter, but we have to be prepared to deal with it if we see it in the surgical field. So overall, in summary, as far as uh, bleeding and cardiac surgery, it is a risk factor. And we all as surgeons realize that we have to be prepared when we go in the operating room. Doctor, what puts someone at risk for hemorrhage? That's a great question. Well, the biggest uh, risk factor, of course, is undergoing surgery. And that's certainly going to contribute to any kind of blood loss that uh, the surgeon may experience in the field just by the simple action of under, uh, undergoing surgery with the instruments. The other things that can put patients at risk are actually diseases. For example, if you have kidney or liver disease, that may increase your risk of bleeding during the surgery. But also, patients that are taking medications that inhibit the platelet's ability to help the blood clot. And these uh, uh, pharmacologic agents or medicines, so to speak, we want to make sure we know wh what you're taking before you go into surgery. So if someone is looking at these risks, what should they know before they go into surgery? Prior to any major surgery, and whether it be cardiovascular or general surgical procedures, there is a preoperative assessment. And this is done by the surgeon uh, prior to the surgery. And this may commonly involve an office visit, and during that office visit, the risk factors of bleeding and also the surgical risk factors in general are discussed. But we also look at things that we can identify that we can change. For example, most all of the patients receive a blood draw. And this is usually done in an outpatient setting, maybe even a week or two before the surgery. And what we're looking for in, this, in these blood draws is we're looking at the red blood cell counts, how many platelets do you have? We wanna make sure that your blood is ready to undergo a surgery. Now, as I deal with cardiovascular surgery, there, a lot of my cases are urgent. We can't wait as long, but we still can do this preoperative risk stratification. That's the fancy medical lingo for that. Doctor, great information. Now, let me ask you this. What are the consequences of bleeding complications during cardiovascular surgery? I can only imagine it can be life-threatening. Yes, it certainly can be. First of all, bleeding in surgery is expected. I mean, this is a truly an invasive procedure that we perform, and we're gonna encounter some bleeding. We like to keep it to a minimum, but, but sometimes it's more than we would expect, and we have ways to deal with that. We first try to do good surgical technique as best we can, put a stitch in it, basically. Sometimes we have to use agents in the field or packing to help control the bleeding, but in general, I gotta be able to see what I'm doing. If there's a lot of bleeding there in the surgical field, it can make it more difficult to place that stitch where it needs to go. Now, during the surgery, we might have to give a blood transfusion. There are some complications that can be associated with blood transfusion. One is you simply could have like an allergic reaction to it. That can happen, it's small, but it can happen. Studies have shown that patients that receive blood over patients that don't may have a higher incidence of complications mm -hmm. following the surgery. The blood transfusion can affect your lungs and it can affect your other organs too. It's also been shown that it, it can increase your length of stay in the hospital potentially, and it may have an effect on mortality as well. So 
We try not to give blood, if, only if absolutely necessary. Doctor, that's why the pre-op work before the surgery is so imperative. The, the preoperative assessment is crucial. Mm -hmm. We need to know what your clotting status is and if you have enough blood cells to make that clot during our planned surgery that's coming up. Great information, doctor. Stay right there because we have much more to cover. So Dr. Bruckner will join us in just a couple minutes. Stay with us. With the advancements in the early detection of breast cancer, the multitude of surgical options available and the number of interventions being performed continues to grow. Despite advances in surgical techniques, hemorrhage remains a major complication associated with these surgeries. Axis Health recently caught up with Dr. Sunny Chatterjee, a surgical oncologist from Tufts Medical Center in Boston. It's important that I assess a patient for her risks for bleeding. And in order to do so, it starts with the past medical history and getting to understand the past medical comorbidities or diseases that patient lives with every day. Certain diseases, uh, such as heart disease, uh, if they have stents, for example, require anticoagulation, which means they have to take blood thinners. And if people are on those medications while having surgery, you can certainly have increased chances for bleeding. The other things that you look for is how much surgery are you doing? If you do a small operation such as a lumpectomy and you remove just a small area of tissue, well, you don't really worry about bleeding too much, especially since you can compress the breast with bandaging afterwards. But once you get into the larger operations like oncoplastic surgery where you do large breast reduction designs or you do mastectomies and you remove the entire breast tissue area, leaving just the skin envelope, and then after that you have to reconstruct them, there are larger surface areas involved. So the chances of bleeding increase with the more surgery you do, which just makes common sense. When a patient undergoes an operation, certainly bleeding can be controlled in the operation. And by the time a surgeon closes his or her incision site, ideally a wound should be quote unquote dry, i.e. it shouldn't be bleeding in front of you. However, after surgery, there are situations where bleeding can restart. A patient may cough, or there might be a situation where there's a high degree of high blood pressure, secondary to pain control, where certain vessels can open up and you can have something called a hematoma or an accumulation of blood where a patient starts to undergo the problems of bleeding. In its most basic form, a hematoma is essentially a collection of blood in a space. So the more surgery one does, the more dissection one does, the more areas a hematoma can occur. Why? Well, first, you cut across more blood vessels that can subsequently bleed. But second, you also create nooks and crevices in the breast area, especially in oncoplastic surgery, where that type of blood can accumulate. After a mastectomy, the actual nook and crevice is a lot bigger. It's, it's actually a large space. So not only have you come across multiple vessels of reasonable size, but those vessels can now bleed into a cavity, creating a large hematoma that then potentially not only puts the patient at risk for bleeding out, but also if this blood accumulates and doesn't get reabsorbed, it can lead to a future infection. You always want to avoid complications after surgery, specifically in the circumstances of treating breast cancer. First and foremost, you know, women are on this journey where they're getting surgery and then after surgery, they will get other treatments which decrease the chances of cancer ever coming back or spreading in the body. We have to treat them effectively and quickly so they heal and get to the next step of treatment. Doctor, we've been talking about the risks of hemorrhage during cardiovascular surgery. What are some of the strategies surgeons do to help stop the bleeding? Things that we can simply do is actually hold pressure while we're there. Okay. Of course, we're trying to put a stitch in whatever is bleeding, and that's gonna be the number one the thing we're trying to do is, is to stop the bleeding from a surgical approach. But also, if we can't do that, or to help to stop bleeding, we actually use a packing material. Just think about it, when you cut your arm, for example, you hold pressure. Right. So the power of holding pressure is also very important in the operating room when you're asleep, even on the inside of your body. So, so we do that quite a bit, and that's a very simple measure. The other thing you can do is you may have to give a blood transfusion, as we discussed, mm -hmm. and while you're, you're holding pressure on the bleeding. 
And of course, this actually lends itself to new technologies that may help us. For example, a glue or a hemostatic powder, what we call a sealant that we can actually use to apply to the surgical field and stop the bleeding. Because time is of the essence here, isn't it, with these new technologies to help out? Absolutely. If the patient continues to bleed, then we're going to have an increasing need for blood transfusion, for example. The patient will be on the operating room table longer than we'd like to be and under general anesthesia. So the sooner we can get that bleeding under control, the better for the patient. Great stuff. Thank you, doctor. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about an innovative technology that is right on time when seconds count. Stay with us. Welcome back everyone. A recent study from a major U.S. surgical center found that 55% of all perioperative complications and 27% of all deaths were hemorrhage or thrombosis related. There is an ever growing need for innovative surgical tools to manage bleeding, not only for surgeons, but for patients alike. Joining me now is Dr. William Spotnitz, Chief Medical Officer at Biomop USA, and of course, Dr. Brian Bruckner, a cardiovascular surgeon. Dr. Bruckner, thank you so much for staying with us. Dr. Spotnitz, thank you and welcome to Access Health. Dr. Spotnitz, you're here to talk about a solution um, for hemorrhage during a surgery, correct? What we're going to talk about is hemostatic agent. This agent is a powder. It's combined of three different materials, collagen, chondroitin sulfate, and thrombin. This combination allows us to have an immediately ready product that's very efficacious and can help stop the bleeding that can sometimes trouble patients. It's called hemoblast bellows. Hemoblast bellows. Okay, how does it work, doctor? The collagen is there in order to help the function of platelets. And as you were discussing a little bit earlier, the platelets help create the blood clot. They form a platelet plug that can actually help stop the bleeding. In addition, the chondroitin sulfate strengthens the clot mm -hmm. and helps it stick to the tissue. And finally, the thrombin, which is present, helps facilitate the speed of clot formation. This is the only combination product powder of its type. That is amazing. Uh, Dr. Bruckner, can you talk about the cardiac application? Sure. As we discussed earlier about the so-called surgical toolbox, so I've added hemoblast to my toolbox. Mm -hmm. in, in addition to putting sutures in or stitches to stop the bleeding, I also now apply hemoblast, the powder, to help stop the bleeding as well, especially in places where the stitch just isn't working all the way. Now, imagine in cardiac surgery, we have uh, several structures that we have to go through, like the breastbone, and then we have the sac around the heart and the heart itself and the great vessels. Now, there can be bleeding around these areas, and I use the hemoblast to help uh, put, put it on, these, on the surfaces of the bone of the sternum and also in the areas around the heart that may be oozing blood. And simply by applying a hemoblast powder and a patch over it and holding pressure really helps uh, decrease the amount of bleeding I see in the surgical field. That's fantastic. Now that's obviously one type of surgery, Dr. Spotnitz. There's laparoscopic, there's other surgeries um, that can utilize this as well? Yes, ma'am. And you know, uh, Dr. Bruckner has described the open applications of the product where the product can be directly applied to the side. Mm -hmm. that you're trying to get it to. But laparoscopically or more minimally invasive surgeries also are critically important. They're often done on the liver, they're done in urology, they're done in gynecology. And when you're doing those types of cases, it's very important to have hemostasis. If you have a little bit of bleeding and that gets on the end of the camera that's being used, you can't see anymore. Of course. And that case might need to be converted to an open case. That's very unfortunate for the patient who was expecting to have small minimally invasive of incisions to now have a large incision. So this product is very easily applied, immediately ready, can go in through the laparoscopic equipment and stop that type of bleeding. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Dr. Sputnitz. Now let's check back in with Dr. Chatterjee, who is in Boston, for his perspective. Take a look. The first time I used Hemoblast, I found that it was very easy to apply. We basically sprayed it into the large cavity of a mastectomy wound and we placed some moist lap pads, and this was a wound that was generally oozing substantially. And this was after I had used cautery, sutures, and clips to control specific vessels and areas that were bleeding. But there was just a general ooze. And this patient in particular we used, was on aspirin. When I actually removed the moist lap pads from the actual breast, I could see this gel 
covering over the entire region of the breast surface upon which I had applied the hemoblast. And this gel surface region uh, had excellent hemostasis, and it just stayed there, and it provided adequate reassurance to me, at least in the OR, where I felt comfortable, where I could close the wound and have the patient safely transferred to the recovery area and avoid, hopefully, the future of a hematoma. I can tell you that my rates of hematoma dropped by 80% anecdotally after using hemoblast when looking at my patients today versus before the date I started using it. It's so convincing that I use it on all my oncoplastic cases presently. I think these new technologies truly do allow a, a surgeon to quickly and efficiently treat bleeding and decrease their complication rates, especially when it comes to hematoma. Welcome back, everyone. Surgical bleeding can be problematic for both patient and, of course, the surgeon. We are continuing our conversation today about the importance of knowing your risk for hemorrhage and how one topical hemostatic agent is benefiting patients today. Dr. Spotnitz, let's pick up from uh, our conversation and let's talk about the complications that bleeding can present. Well, number one, bleeding prevents the surgeon from being able to see. If a surgeon can't see, they can't operate accurately. Makes sense. Number two, if the anesthesiologist can't maintain the blood pressure and keep the hemodynamics of the patient okay, that's going to present a very difficult situation. And that happens if the bleeding is too excessive. There are a number of other significant complications associated with bleeding. It includes things like infection, the need for a blood transfusion. If you're getting multiple blood transfusions, you might be in the ICU for a more prolonged mm. period of time. You might need to be on a ventilator for a more prolonged period of time. The morbidity and mortality of the whole procedure goes up and as Dr. Bruckner knows that's something that a surgeon is very concerned about. Okay so let's talk about the benefits and that's what everybody wants to hear of hemoblast bellows. The product can be used in open or laparoscopic cases. The product sticks to areas where there's bleeding because it's a powder it's like talcum powder when you get out of the shower you can get the product to stick to wherever you might need it to be. So there are a number of different advantages for treating bleeding. It can treat bleeding up to 117 mLs per minute. We studied that through a very thorough bleeding severity score that allows us to know exactly how much bleeding the product can treat. That's fantastic. Dr. Bruckner, uh, the technology now that you're seeing benefiting your patients, could you elaborate? It certainly has helped. I've added it to my surgical toolbox. I've, no I've noticed that my pa patients overall are doing better in the operating room, meaning they have less blood transfusions, at, at least from what I can tell during my surgeries. Mm. And also, I'm, my surgeries are shorter because I'm using an adjunct such as a hemostatic agent. Also the other benefit would be that I see less blood coming from the tubes that we place in the chest after surgery, and I've noticed that in the ICU as well. Okay, we talked about the benefits. Can we talk about risks if there are any, doctor? Yes, ma'am. There are the standard risks associated with any hemostatic agent, things like an allergic response to various components in the material. Remember we talked about it's a combination product. It contains some porcine and some bovine elements, uh, but nothing unusual uh, for the product itself. Doctor, I wanted to ask you, how does this technology contribute to, you know, the future, future surgeries? Well, you know, Olga, all the time, patients are demanding better and better operations, more and more success, smaller and smaller incisions, perhaps instead of an open case, a laparoscopic case, or even a robotic case. Hemoblast bellows, in my opinion, is ideal for application in minimally invasive laparoscopic or robotic procedures. The powder, once it exits the bellows applicator, goes down a long applicator that's available for robotic or laparoscopic procedures. It comes out the other end immediately. It's easy to apply, highly efficacious, and in my opinion, the best agent in that type of application. And like with any surgery, lots of benefits and risks, but Goodness gracious, what a great benefit this has been to have you two to inform us about this information and this latest technology. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you for the Thank opportunity you. to talk with I you. I appreciate your time. And of course, if you'd like more information on today's topic, you can visit hemoblast.com. Or as always, you can go to our website, accesshealth.tv. We'll see you next time.